Hi, I'm Kate Arthur, Editor-at-Large at Variety. As part of our Power of Women conversations, I'm speaking with the women of Grey's Anatomy. Star and producer Ellen Pompeo, who plays Meredith Grey. Co-star Chandra Wilson, who plays Miranda Bailey and has also directed 21 episodes of the show. Debbie Allen, executive producer, director, and co-star, who plays Catherine Fox and has directed 24 episodes. And Krista Vernoff, the executive producer and showrunner of Grey's Anatomy. I'm speaking with you virtually today because of COVID-19, but all of you are working and following strict protocols in order to film this season. Thank you for being here. Ellen and Chandra, how is it for the actors right now with all the new safety protocols in place? We're more fortunate than some other actors, whereas we're in full PPE. Not only is the crew in full PPE, but we are as well because we get to play doctors. So once again, we're really in this unbelievable sweet spot as we always are with this show somehow. We always end up with this golden light shining on us and to get it during this time is incredibly meaningful and we're having fun. And I also think as a company, we are very, very aware of taking care of each other. Like that's really important to all of us so that this entire production can have a job right now. So not only are um, we in scenes that have been written in order to keep us safe, but our production goal all around is to be safe here as well as, you know, when we go home. So I really feel that all the time, that we're all really doing everything we can to take care of each other. So it's a privilege and honor to be in this situation right now. Debbie, you directed the first two episodes of this season. How is it different? Very different. Uh, It takes more time. We have protocols that dictate what zone can be in that first rehearsal, second rehearsal, used to be it. Now it's first, second, third, and sometimes four rehearsals to educate the crew on what we're doing in the scene. All of our stand-ins, all of our extras, we have hired them basically for the season so that they are tested with us and we're feel comfortable with everyone on the crew. We're tested three times a week and we have all of our protocols. So it's very different, but we're still getting great work done. We just have to adjust. The universe is changing all the time. So this is, this is a big change, but we are, are, are meeting all the challenges, I would say, and feeling very confident about finishing our season on time. Krista, you decided to set the season of Grey's Anatomy in the world of the pandemic, which plenty of shows aren't going to, I'm sure. Can you talk about that decision? Yeah, it was a complicated decision because we were all living through a pandemic and usually Grey's Anatomy is a certain amount of escapism. So um, I came into the writer's room thinking I had gone back and forth and back and forth. Never leave a writer alone for that many months inside her own head. (laughs) Back and forth, back and forth. Are we going to do it or are we not going to do it? And I I gathered the writers and I said, you guys, I think we're not going to do it. I think we need some escapism. I went on at some length about why. And then I said, who wants to be brave and convince me that I'm wrong? And one by one, it was like... (laughs) (laughs) And the most persuasive... um, Listen, the writers are brilliant and they had some pitches that were so exciting to me that it made me feel like, oh, we could do our show and the romance and the humor and the escapism and the pandemic. So that was persuasive. And then there, there were three three doctors in the room and uh, one, one of a doctor writer and a couple of advisors, and they are changed by COVID. And um, Nasser Al-Azari, who's been working with COVID patients through the whole thing while I've been at home thinking inside my head, said, this is permanently changing medicine. It's the biggest medical story of our lifetimes and it's, it's, you know, and it's the biggest medical show and it's a shame not to do it. We owe it to the medical community and the frontline workers to tell these stories. And I was like, fine. (laughs) (laughs) It was like 15 minutes into the day. I was like, fine, we're doing the pandemic. (laughs) But it became my job to make sure that we had um, exciting, you know, I call it fan candy, fun, things that aren't just about PPE and the pandemic and and to let you breathe and to let you laugh. And and we've come up with some really fun, creative ways to do that. 
as you say, doctors have been on the front lines of the coronavirus and you've dedicated the season to essential workers. Ideally, Krista, how would that urgency play out on the show? The stakes have just, they've changed. And that is the thing that I noticed every time a doctor or a nurse came to our writer's room to talk to us is they were changed as human beings. They were different human beings than the people we've been talking to every year. I want to honor that tonally. We've been having conversations about the tone and the energy and the urgency. And I want to inspire people to take care of each other, to wear their masks, to help this pandemic end. I want to honor the doctor's um, and, and the change to the medical system. And it also has to play out like Grey's Anatomy. And so far, I feel like we're threading that needle. All of these women here, we're working together and we're threading that needle. And, and Debbie Allen is, is, was so humble, but I don't think any other director could have carried off what she carried off in those first two hours. The, it, it was, she's always inspiring, but I was like, I've never seen anybody work so fast and so focused. And it's really hard working in COVID. The protocols are really extreme. And just, it's been an amazing group effort behind. And I think it's it's playing out behind the scenes and it's playing out on camera in a way that's that's exciting. It's actually really exciting to me. I no longer regret, I never regretted it, but but I was worried and I'm no longer worried. I'm excited by our show. Ellen, since the coronavirus has become so politicized, do you think that this season will end up being more political than usual? I don't think so. I, I think, well, you know, the nature, you know, we're not responsible for politicizing COVID. That's not on us. There's plenty of people who have done that. But I think that we've always had an incredible opportunity with this show to be able to do multiple things at, at one time, right? We've always been able to entertain while sort of touching on certain things and just wouldn't call it being political, I'd call it giving people something else to consider. And so we'll continue to do that as we always have. I don't think we're gonna do it any more this season than we do normally. I think it's our job to humanize it. I feel like yeah. the politicians have politicized what is an illness that affects human beings regardless of political affiliation. So our job is to make it human, not political. Grey's Anatomy was created by Shonda Rhimes and is currently run almost entirely by women. Since Shonda isn't here today, can you talk about her as a trailblazer in this industry? Wow. We all, who where do we all start? Where do we start? Where do we start? <laughs> well, I was probably the last one to join this family. Krista was here from the beginning. You guys were here from the beginning. Krista took a little leave, she came back. I came in in season seven and I was just in awe of Shonda. I had watched Grey's Anatomy and the movies she had done before this, and I was just wondering when, were, when was I gonna get my chance to come over here? And then I came and uh, it was amazing to be in the room with her and to see how she is with the writers, how she is generous and listens and how she can make a decision, which is what we have now. She and Krista Vernoff could be salt and pepper. You could say that. <laughs> Because, because they're very different, but still come from the same sensibility. So Shonda is is a, a force of nature, if you will. Look at all that she's created in this short time. And uh, she is still in the making. So we're just seeing the beginning of where she's really going to go. I'm, I'm really excited to see, because she has such a great base from which she is springing. You know, in the dance world, you gotta have good feet to get up off the ground. She has a, she got a high jump, honey. They might need it in the NBA playoffs, honey. I don't know, they might. I think the thing that I get the most from Shonda and probably from the beginning um, is the word possibility. Being who she was and the creator of this show is something I hadn't seen when it was time for me to audition for Grey's Anatomy. Um, that title, executive producer, I hadn't been around that title in a woman who looks like Shonda Rhimes. Um, and then Shondaland being burst from, you know, the efforts on this ground, right, was something else. And then me becoming a series television, a dramatic series television director had never even considered it, had never even thought about it before. And the possibilities just keep growing and keep growing. So um, that 
um, is the inspiration that I've always gotten from her. And it's been collective because uh, so many of us haven't just stayed in one role. We've, you know, um, added to it, added layers to who we are as individuals, as artists, because of the possibilities that we've seen through her. There's so much to say. She can appear aloof, right? And, and very quiet and very observant. But then man, when she has an idea, especially in the early days as an actor, she would have these ideas and I would say, that's a terrible idea. I don't, I don't like this, I don't wanna do this. And then it goes in the script anyways, cause she's Shonda. And then you have to do it cause she's Shonda. And then it turns out to be the biggest thing, you know, of the show. And people just respond to it like overwhelmingly positive and it becomes, you know, in the lexicon and in Webster's dictionary. And it's just, it's like, what? That was a terrible idea. (laughs) She has this weird sixth sense to know what is gonna work and what isn't. And that that's that's a gift on some other level. You know, that goes beyond just being a great writer. She's a very uh, fearless, creative thinker. And I think that that's an element that you could be a great writer all day long. You could, you could have a lot of attributes, but what makes a superstar is being a fearless, creative thinker, not just a writer. And, and I think that's who she is. Yeah. And a revolutionary. She's like a quiet revolutionary. <laughs> and, and what I mean by quiet is in the early years of this show, We never had a single conversation that I can remember about changing the face of television. It was always about what's gonna make the best story, what's gonna be most, the funniest, the most dramatic. We had a huge fights, like you say, like George and Meredith are gonna sleep together and then she's gonna start to cry. And I was like, no, (laughs) everybody will hate us, hate us, hate us. And we fought it out and- And I cried for real during the scene. It was noisy. It I've was still never watched it either. Noisy, and she, she was like, "They don't have to love it. They just have to watch it and talk about it." It's not always about being likable. It's not. It's about entertainment. It's about being entertaining. I'm in a restaurant. I look up. Grey's Anatomy is on the air, and here's a scene, and it's like a family of four, a black family, and Isaiah Washington and Jim Pickens and Chandra Wilson are the doctors in the room, and I, I'm, I have full body chills as I say this because I turned to my friends and I said, "Oh, we're making a revolution." Uh I thought we were just making a show. It's a revolution. I had never seen that on network television and there's no talk about it. We're not talking about it. It's Shonda was fighting the fights to make the show look the way the world looked, which wasn't happening on network television before Shonda fought those fights. Not since the seventies and Norman Lear and all those, there are so many amazing shows. They had gone away for, black people on television had gone away. Right. You know, I mean, but also those shows where the Jeffersons, it was almost exclusively black people. This was yes. like a hospital right. and all the do- and half the doctors were black people. Like it was it was a merging of worlds as Shonda, what Shonda always said is it's the world we live in. I want right. it to look like the world we live in. It was really not on TV at the time. And it changed TV. It really, really changed TV. And that's what's amazing. She knows what the fight is. She knows what the right fight is. She knows how to win it while serving you cotton candy and popcorn. It's it's a magical combination. She served this up in the most successful way, but then we still, the industry still, as much praise as she got and as much recognition as she got, which she deserved every bit of it, no one was smart enough to say, well, we should do what she's doing. No one really took that gift that she gave to the entertainment community and said, oh, we should make our shows or movies or sets more inclusive. No one thought to do what she was doing. That's what's like incredible to me. You know, Debbie has an interesting perspective because Debbie was a part and executive producer of so many shows. Like a different world. Yeah, a different world. Yeah. And what's your perspective on on, on black shows or, or black people representation? Well, it has evolved. Let's just say that. It has evolved. I mean, as a kid, we only saw Diane Carroll and Julia. And we also saw Leslie Uggams, when I was a little bitty girl, singing on something to do with Mitch, sing along with some show my grandmother watched. We didn't really see black people in television. And then there was an explosion in the film world. Black exploitation bailed Hollywood out. They realized there was a huge economic advantage to producing films with black people, Shaft and all those movies big, but there was no reinvestment 
in the development of those directors and writers and people. And then you looked up in the, the show that really changed everything uh, in the sitcom world was The Cosby Show. Because we had people that were, uh, well, there was Jimmy Walker's show. Good the, Times. Good Times. Mm -hmm. The Norman Lear shows were really fun, you know, uh, and they were relevant. They did stories. In my first, my debut on television, I played a young girl who escaped because she was a drug addict on prom night. We, I was J.J. Walker's Give girlfriend. Give me one J.J. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still get calls when it comes on. He was doing shows <laughs> that were relevant about social and, and human issues in the comedy world. I remember when I started on Fame, I was the choreographer, I became a director. There was no, there were no women directing. The only women I saw was a script supervisor and maybe an occasional writer, but it was a male world, the whole crew. You know, I had to make sure I could laugh at the cowboy jokes because it was the world that we came up in. And then, you know, things evolved. Gary David Goldberg started doing shows and I was invited to take over to be one of the principal directors of Family Ties, which was not about black people, which was exciting to me because we were always pigeonholed to be in a certain place. A different world changed a lot of things. The Cosby Show changed the world's perception of what, you know, black people, middle-class black America was. So right now, when I look at the time, I look that there was a vast playing field where we were not there. We were actors, but we were not the writers and the directors and the producers. And now that world has opened up and changed. Before the, the explosion this year, you started to see it. You know, when, when Empire hit, everybody wanted a cookie. <laughs> you know, that show made everybody want a, a Taraji Henson. So black people have always identified America's culture in a way that no other group has. But now we're in a place and a time where are we going back or is it sliding? You know, we're all going up, 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 up. And now where are we now? So a show like Grey's Anatomy is what the world needs because it shows the humanness of all people and the importance and the roles of all people together and how this community reflects the world, yeah. which is what we do. I think piggybacking on what you said, Krista, um, unlike um, saying that, and uh, in, in, in much to what fame was, right? Fame had black characters on the show, but it wasn't a black show, right? Grays had black characters on the show, but it wasn't a black show. Most of the time when you would see um, black actors on TV or, or black people behind the camera, this show was like a black show. And that was one of the things I noticed right away when I finally saw Grey's Anatomy first season was that I didn't know what we had done, right? Because I was just here shooting the show and watching it, I said, oh, that's a hospital. Like that's what a hospital looked like. Those are the people that walk around in the hospital, just like fame. Those were the kids that go to that school. So we never were a show to beat you over the head with what you were supposed to see. We just showed you. We don't have to make political commentary. We just show it to you. And then as an audience, you get to walk away and think about, wow, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about something that way before. I, had, I related to that character. I related to that other human being as opposed to being hit over the head with what you should think or what you should feel. On another topic, in terms of her choosing those fights, the fight to let Meredith Grey wake up unapologetic after a one night stand, not remember the guy's name, yes. kick him out, like not caring what his name is, shameless, and in just like enjoying sex, think for the orgasms, like can you go? That wasn't happening in a number one, in a lead of a show on network television. That was a big fight that she fought and won. The likability fight. Meredith being suicidal in the early years of the show, dark and twisty, depressed. Those things were not okay. Women had to be likable. Men could be anti-heroes. Women had to, the amount of conversations that we had to have, yeah, but is she likable? Is she gonna be likable? Are we gonna like her? And Shonda going, I like her <laughs> in those early years. I recognize her. She reminds me of my friends. I'm good. Are you not? 
<laughs> you know? and, and, and that's such an interesting, important point to bring up because the truth is, as actors, we're conditioned to, we don't know those conversations are happening, right? And we're reading it saying, oh my God, I'm not going to be likable. And as women, we are groomed to be likable. We are taught we must be likable. We are taught we have to look a certain way. We're conditioned to feel that we have to be that. Mm. And because you weren't, because you let yourself be a whole human being, because Shonda, because we fought for the right for Meredith and Bailey and Burke to be whole human beings with whole sex lives and not a network TV idea of likable, you might not have been likable, but now you're iconic. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Now, I yeah. embraced unlikable Bailey. I loved it. <laughs> I was like, right. you talk about me all you want to. You know, like Bailey had an agenda and and it, it was unapologetic about it. As was Sandra O. Oh. Sandra Christina's oh ambitious. Was yeah. amazing yeah. at being unlikable and really just such a committed, loving, it. incredible, committed actress she is. The idea of likable versus unlikable. She's beloved. Mm-hmm but was not written to be likable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why do you say that? Like, yeah. no, no. Shonda always, that was the character I struggled to write most in the beginning was Christina. Cause she, she, would, she would go, it's too many words and too much apology. Like uh. she doesn't, she's, she's not explaining herself. She's not apologizing. It's fewer words. She just wants what she wants. And it was like, oh, Wow, like that's not happening on network TV with the women. Women are conditioned to think that way. We're all the same age, right? right? And so as Shonda and I are the same age. Those ideas would never occur to me. When I say a creative thinker, yeah. it's like to think outside the box and to think a different way than, than most people think, you know, is, is really an exceptional talent and skill and quality to have. You guys are burning through my questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's like all the time. <laughs> this is why we, we can go 17 seasons, because we all have so much to say. So years before, there was a real conversation in Hollywood about representation on screen and behind the camera. Grey's Anatomy was way ahead on that. Can you talk about how that evolved? We just did that. <laughs> we just talked about that. That just happened. In terms of women women and people of color directing. Well, I will take that on. I came in season seven, and then shortly thereafter, Shonda called me into the what I call the principal's office. <laughs> I didn't know what it was about and asked me if I would become executive producing director. And I was really taken aback and I loved the idea. And one of my biggest responsibilities was hiring the directors and you know, being there for the cast and just overseeing a lot of things. But hiring the directors was a huge responsibility. And I decided on my own that I would hire 50% women. This is before any Me Too or anything of it all, uh, because I have always been a woman and I've always known opportunities were far and few in between and I, we needed to do that. I also hired the first black males, men that directed our show. And uh, all of a sudden started getting all these phone calls about where are you find these people? Like they didn't, you know, people didn't know where they were. I said, they're right here. And I pulled in some wonderful people like Victoria Mahoney, who, I mean, we hired her once in my season, I hired her my first year and we can't even get her now. She's so busy and then Zinga Stewart. And then I mentored so many wonderful directors, women like Krista Vernoff did her first episode under my watch and Miss, <laughs> my girl, Ellen Pompeo, who I call her, uh, I call it pony. I tell her to get on her pony and ride because she's always got ideas. <laughs> uh, and of course, Chandra Wilson was already directing. In fact, my first episode, I was actually shadowing her. And that was so nice for my hometown, Houston. <laughs> But uh, yes, I introduced a whole nother group of people, even a woman from Norway, Cecile Mosley, who's incredible. And- uh, Sydney Freeland. Sydney Freeland, yes, Sydney Freeland, who's the, probably the first transgender uh, director in network dramatic hour television. And um, 
they're all really grateful to have worked here at Grey's Anatomy because it's almost like there's a school kind of environment, a nurturing environment here that we have created that we, you know, when directors shadow me, I didn't just leave them in a corner, I would give them a test. Okay, okay, how are you gonna do this scene? Uh, uh, oh, you're not ready, okay, mm -mm. <laughs> No, no, I'm gonna be ready, and this pushed them. Look at these women right here, look at these directors right here. I don't have to go any further than right here. So, you know, they always, Christopher and I was saying to me, Debbie, but, but if you get sick, I said, Miss Thing, look in the mirror. You got me, you got you, you got her. We're good, we are good. Yeah. Debbie's an amazing teacher. She's an amazing mentor. I was terrified. I don't know about you. I was terrified to, to sit in the director's chair because it's really, it's one thing to like stand behind a director and go, this is what I want it to be. Make it so. You know what I mean? Can you make her talk faster? But to actually find a way to say to the actor is an art that is different than the art of the producer. So Debbie was just an, an amazing uh, mentor to me through that, really. I'm grateful. It was, it was terrifying and thrilling. Yeah. See, that was a great answer, Krista. Why did you <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In a separate interview for our cover story, Ellen mentioned this might be the show's final season. Yes, she's thinking about it, people. Um, if this final season is this year or whenever it is, what do you think the legacy of Grey's Anatomy will be? I got to say Grey's Anatomy has inspired a vast number of women to go to medical school. And, um, and it has saved a lot of lives. The medicine and the, the accuracy with which we portray it and the medical team behind the scenes. We get a lot of letters of, you know, this episode of Grey's I watched, I, I remembered and I saved my baby's life when she was choking. We get a lot of letters about things like that. But, but really like the women in medical school, the black women in medical school, thanks to Miranda Bailey, it's a powerful legacy. It's changed the world in so many ways, but that's the thing that always chokes me up. Women who said, I was interested in medicine and I only thought I would be a nurse, but because I saw Miranda Bailey, oh, I can be a doctor, I can be a surgeon. Um, that still happens, you know, in season 17. It continues to happen. We get a firsthand look at what um, what history and legacy is because of all of the technology waves that we have lived through <laughs> since we started, you know, and with things like Netflix and people finding us all over again or finding mm -hmm. us for the first time in season 17. And, you know, we're just fresh and new to them all over again. And that I'm, I'm so complimented by that. I feel just i feel the compliment of the show that we are able to be comfort food to generations basically of, of people that they go to and they can't watch one episode. They have to binge. And that's, you know, that's the only way that you watch Grey's Anatomy now is on a binge. And that's, that's, that's pretty amazing history to have been a part of. Ellen, how about you? I would say legacy is such a big word. <laughs> You know, I think the second biggest compliment we ever get other than, you know, my son is a neurosurgeon because of you is um, I watch the show with my daughter. Mm -hmm. My daughter's a teenager. We don't have a lot in common anymore, but we love to sit and binge Grays. And I think at its core, Grays has always brought human beings together. And that goes back to talking about the, the stories that we try to tell and opening people's eyes a little bit. I remember the first episode that I was really like, I'm so glad America is seeing this. And I don't know what season it is, I'm sure you will know, is we had two gay soldiers and they were making out on the show. And I was like, yes, there's, yes, there's gay men in the military, yes. Um, you know, that says it all for me. And the fact that people can, can, can come together and watch the show and think about things they may not have ordinarily thought about or see things normalized and humanized in a way that a lot of people really need to see. It helps you become a better human being. If, if this show has helped anybody become a better human being, then that's the legacy I, I'd love to, to sit with. Segwaying into a few lighter questions before we wrap up, um, for the actors, what's a script that you've gotten that has shocked you? 
uh, shocked in a, a good way. I always go back to the the season six finales with the shooter. Um, I just remember how excited we were at the table when we were reading, you know, those two episodes. And mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a nice breath of fresh air. And I remember people saying, wow, this feels like all new grades at this point. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that's what it felt like. I'll say the pilot episode to this season, girl, hold on. (laughs) (laughs) We are bringing it. We are bringing it this season. Just Mm -hmm. hold on. It's coming. (laughs) What nobody thinks we can continue to do, we have done, we are doing. Hold on. Hold on. (laughs) That's all we're going to say about that. That is a tease. I don't (laughs) <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I've been doing this for a minute. <laughs> um, have you, this is for any of you, have you kept anything from the Grays set over the years? You mean like the clothes that we steal? <laughs> <laughs> no, that I you can't keep things. All of my best outfits. And this is my tradition. I don't work where I can't keep the clothes. I tell, <laughs> it's in my contract. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have it. No, I haven't. No. I took the Halloween wreath off of Bailey's door. Oh. It was such a nice wreath. It's black. It's got all these. Yeah, I took that. When it's over, whenever that is, uh, we'll all come. We'll ransack the place, I'm sure. For souvenirs. I've taken a lot of dark chocolate from the crafty truck. Does that count? Oh, my God. But you know, I do, again, the clothes. Ramel, our designer, she's amazing. And so I'm always, well, okay, this season, can I borrow that, you know, for the summer? <laughs> and somehow it just stays in my closet. I'm out. <laughs> Ramel is beet red right now over there. <laughs> Good thing you have that visor on, Ramel. It's taking you down a couple shades. <laughs> for everyone, but I'll start with Krista. What is your favorite episode or scene you've ever done? I wrote an episode season three called Six Days. It turned into Six Days Parts One and Two because it it ran so long. We had to turn it uh, into two episodes and shoot extra material. But it was about the death of my dad. And um, it was about the death of George O'Malley's dad. But it was very much my story. And uh, it's it's the thing I'm I'm most proud of. Uh, I, I still, I'm really proud of it. Too many episodes, too many seasons. I, 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 I don't, I mean, there's been a lot of good ones. <laughs> I can't single anything out. Debbie, do you have one that you've directed or, or just went, that you've acted in that is your favorite? Well, I loved our dinner party episode last season, which was really Catherine and, and Richard. Richard's breakup and with the family. I thought it was, uh, we had so many wonderful things to play and that, and, but then I don't know, I, it was really good when they gave uh, Catherine cancer and that was actually on your watch, Krista. That was, those were some tough scenes to play to, um, it's, it's interesting because I never even told you guys while we were shooting that episode, I was actually getting tests because I had some little variations in, in a couple of my, <laughs> Uh, tests and I was like Phew. but it was so real for me yeah uh, on a whole nother level but there were several beautiful episodes you played those so beautifully and I need to talk about um also 1519 which was the hallway of women which the Debbie hallway directed. of women the that was silent really- all these years this episode we did about rape and women who are survivors not just victims but survivors and uh we changed the face of the planet with that episode and around the world, we encouraged people to stand up for themselves and not to be shame and not to feel it was their fault and all the beautiful things that were written. You know, it all starts with the writing and that's uh, where we live and breathe every week to week. The, the writing has been incredible, just incredible. Chandra, did you have a favorite? Be- oh. Again, that's hard. Um, so it's it's easier to say a favorite directed episode. Mm. And I think that that was probably 
season 10 sliding doors uh, where Sandra O's mm-hmm. character was jumping through time. But y- you have to watch the director's cut. <laughs> on the because I, I was so over on that episode because it was long it was a long episode but it was it was a lot of fun because the characters got to do you know they you know got to use their imagination and they got to uh, you know be out of character for a while but um um Sandra wanted me to take care of her for that, you know, for, um, she thought she kind of looked at it as her last episode, but we gave her more, um, to finish the season. But, uh, so that, that was an honor for me to kind of be in that position and, and take her through that journey in season 10. That was cool. I have to say, watching the show, because I left the show for not a minute. Debbie's like, she left for a minute. I left for seven years. <laughs> seven years. I was like, oh, season seven, I've done this. I left for seven years, and the show is still. Uh, so I came back. and um, But catching up on the ones that I wasn't here for, that last episode, that farewell to Christina, you guys dancing it out when she oh. says, you're the son. I hadn't seen the show in really seven years and I was sitting weeping like weeping it was so moving it's you know it's good tv (laughs) great tv great tv this is a perfect segue into my final question which is what is an episode of Grey's Anatomy that's made you cry Ooh, okay filming it or watching it Uh, (laughs) either or both song of silence where which was actually directed by Denzel Washington, which was when Meredith was attacked by one of her patients brutally because he'd had a seizure of some kind. And he, oh, she was almost blind, couldn't hear, couldn't talk. The entire Gray's cast was in that trauma room trying to help her survive. That episode took my heart. And the way you played it, it just was just, you know, because it went over time and we weren't sure what was going to happen. And when she finally first said something, it just made me cry. I still remember <laughs> it always. That was definitely one of my favorite episodes being directed by Denzel was um, definitely a highlight of all 17 seasons for me. I mean, he's one of my acting idols and such an incredible talent and force. And to have him um have the humility to come in here because of Miss Allen and want to direct an episode of, you know, our little show, I thought was um, so exciting. And it was really sort of a boost. I think they knew I needed something that year. I was really, I was really losing my steam. (laughs) And, um, and they knew that I needed something. And Debbie came through like she always does and gave me the gift of Denzel and that episode. And it was, it was really fantastic. So that would definitely be one of my highlights for sure. Now the show has gone on so long that we all care so, so deeply about every aspect of the show. And it's interesting doing a show for this long and having this much perspective. I don't know how Chandra feels about it, but, and I've said this publicly before, I've had whole seasons where I'm just so exhausted and so over it, I'm just really kind of checked out. I I, I don't care about my storyline. I just have to do whatever I have to do to get through, right? And, and I always admired Sandra Oh so much. She had the energy and the bandwidth to fight for her character and fight for her storyline, you know, every single season, every single episode. I mean, maybe not every single episode. I can't really speak for her, but I can speak for myself and my admiration I had for her energy to be able to really make sure her stories were um, had meaning for her. So I've had my seasons of, of really just trying to get through it, you know? But at this stage of the game, it is such a legacy that we I think we really all feel the weight and um, we really care. And there's so many women here that you don't see, that there's so many more women and, and people here that you don't see what they do who uh, care so, so, so deeply about the legacy of this show and the stories that we tell. And I think that that's one of the keys to our success is that um, we really care. Our audiences truly grow to love these characters and care about every part 
of them, the good stuff, the crazy stuff. The So anytime, you know, if a character has to die or a character goes missing, like they get mad at us. They get mad at the show because, you know, they're they're losing somebody that basically lives in their house, right? When you're watching our show in your house on that little box, they're in your house. So I, still an episode that makes me cry whenever I see it is is 007 when we figure out that that's O'Malley at the end of season five and 007 gets written in Meredith's hand. I'm like, what? It's what? You know? Um, And that's still to this day. Anytime I watch that episode, I'm like, oh my God. No. Uh, So, yeah, right? Me too. That one. (laughs) Oh man. The first time we watched that in the writer's room, we used to gather we knew we'd read the script. We knew, and we still stood up and like screamed at the TV. That was yeah. crazy. Yeah. I'll say more recently, the one that just laid me out was um, when Ben and Bailey had to have the talk with Tuck that he doesn't get to play by the same rules as his white friends. It was in season fourteen, um, and it was so beautifully, beautifully, beautifully played, and so just, just so powerful. And I think it it affected a lot of minds and a lot of hearts to see this character that they love so much have to say those words to her son. That felt really impactful. And just every time I watched the scene, I wept at, sitting in the editing room, crying, <laughs> crying and crying because of the reality. And and the amount of people that didn't know that that was the reality. Yeah. Right. Like, you should again. probably run that episode once a week. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you should probably like, tell again, ABC we need to run that again like, and again and we're again. We're not hitting anybody over the head. We're just telling you what it is. Mm-hmm. Zoe and Clack sat in the away. writer's room yeah. and talked about how old her son is and then when is she going to have the talk? And I was like, wait, what? What's the talk? It was like we were weeping in the writer's room. And I was like, Go write that episode. <laughs> Zoanne, talking about the power of women, Zoanne Clack was an emergency room doctor before she came and, and uh, has been on the writing staff for the entire run of the show. Linda Klein, who's our medical magician who makes the show look so real. Uh, you know, Ramel, we talked about, Lisa Taylor. There's so many women. Linda Lowy was our casting director forever. Alex Patsavas finding the music. There are so many powerful women caring so deeply for the show, for the world, for each other. There's a reason this show goes on like it does.